Hello, my name is Aaron Fountain. Today is March 17, 2022. And are you on Wilson's name, please? Uh, Willie Wilson. Willie Wilson. Okay. And I'll start off this interview with the question I like to ask everybody. So, can you tell me about yourself? Um, when and when were you born, your parents, and childhood up for you? Well, let's see. I was born here in Cleveland in 1941. Um, I was raised here in Cleveland. I lived in the uh, projects for a few years. And then we moved to the uh, uh, Quincy area of Cleveland. We were there until uh, I went to go to college, college university in 1960. And uh, graduated from there with a, a degree in electrical engineering. And then I started, to, I came back to Cleveland and worked for Jones and Laughlin Steel Corporation for uh, about four years. Then I left there and went to uh, start to work for Ohio Bell. Worked for Ohio Bell until uh, until I retired in, in 2000. In 2000. And, uh, I joined uh, Corey Church in 1994 and I've been a member of the since then. Okay, what did your parents do for a living? Well, let's see, well, that's kind of an interesting story, you know. <laughs> I picked my, my mother, I mean, she never really worked, she was just a housekeeper, she was, uh, you know, one of four kids, and then my father, my father died when I was uh, about four or five years old, so she had, she, you know, my mother raised four, four of us pretty much by herself from that point on, so, so that was kind of, uh, kind of a struggle for her. My sister, my oldest sister, who just passed away a couple of years ago, she helped out quite a bit. Well, she was, uh, let's see, about maybe 17, 18 at the time my father died. And so she just started to work, so she did fall down, you know, when she started working. Okay. So, what neighborhood did you live in growing up? I lived in the uh, central area, that's uh, on the Unwin Road in project areas. Projects, that's still there now, in fact. They just renovated it. And then I uh, we moved from there. And we lived in the uh, Quincy area, Quincy Cedar area. How, how would you just describe the neighborhood uh, coming up? How would I describe it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I would describe it probably in terms of the, of the people, uh, the neighbors, because the neighbors at that time, and it seemed like in those neighborhoods, you know, it seemed like everybody knew everybody. And so everybody was fairly close, so I had a lot of friends in the neighborhood at the time. And it was just uh, a lot different than it is now, I think. Where, you, you know, you live in the neighborhood, and they know the next door neighbor, but you don't know as many people like you did, in, at least when I was growing up. You know, it must be seen like you know, everybody on the street at that time. So that was, uh, that was to me, a big, you know, a major factor in the neighborhood. Okay. One thing I know, um, Cleveland in the, especially in the 50s and 60s, the schools were overcrowded as well as the neighborhoods, um, especially particularly on the east side. So do you have any memories of overcrowded? No, I don't think, let's see, I went to uh, East Technical High School, mm -hmm. and no, it wasn't overcrowded at that time, as far as I'm concerned. Now, now uh, East Technical was a technical high school, and it still kind of emphasized the trade, you know, like, uh, carpentry, electrical work, mechanical, I mean, but people were moving away from that as far as uh, wanting to go into those types of uh, uh, those types of jobs. And a lot of the uh, classes and programs that they had originally, they didn't have enough, they didn't have enough people that wanted to take the classes. So slowly, you know, those classes just started to be just continuing all together. And, uh, in fact, some of them went to the to the west side, you know, to uh, Max Hayes High School, which is also a tree, mm -hmm. a tree oriented high school. So, like say, for instance, the, uh, they used to teach um, an airplane engine repair. You know, that and they couldn't find any students that were willing to take that, and uh, so, so that program left all together. I took the electrical. 
courses in because I was really planning on becoming an electrician, electrical and electrical courses at the time. And it just so happened I was able to go to, go to college. Here. And you, you stayed at East Tech the entire time? Or yes, yes, I stayed there the entire time. Yes. Yeah. The, only, the only problem with going to the technical school is that you're not quite as, you know, you don't have as many academic courses that you uh, that you need really to go to college. And I was somewhat deficient, so I had to make up some you know, when, I, when I went to college. Of course, I had to have some, of, some of the courses that you need. I didn't take because I was taking technical courses. So I was able to make some of them up. Uh, you know, I had some of the courses that you could make up in the school. So, take, I think so it took me, instead of four years, it took me four and a half years. You know. I think about the teacher, though, the teacher is also African American. Yeah, I know a lot of black schools tend to like have a despair. No, no, not, not very many. You know, okay. uh, that's the only person, only, only African American teacher at that, that time I was a practice music teacher. Mm -hmm. All the other ones were, at least for my memory, almost all the other ones were uh, not uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. In fact, I remember his name, Mr. Ben, who taught, taught music. But all the other teachers, uh, math, everything else. Uh, everything else. Okay. How do you describe this uh, student relationship with the teachers? I don't know, like black schools, that they grew some kind of like resentment among educators. No, I always, I, don't, I, I thought, I thought the teachers were really the teachers that I remember were very passionate. In my opinion, I mean, they. I, I remember the. I remember the English teacher especially. He was especially passionate about what he was doing. I mean, you you could tell that he loved what he was doing. I mean, he come in class. I mean, he was enthusiastic all the time, all the time about teaching English. And in fact, he uh, you know he's the one. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, play Pygmalion. Have you ever heard of Pygmalion? My fair lady. Yeah, he introduced us to that. In fact, he had us go to the play, you know, when they had the playhouse on Carnegie. He had, he took the whole class to that to see that play, Pygmalion, which is the same as My Fair Lady, if you've ever heard of My Fair Lady. But I mean, he just, he went into class, stamping his feet. <laughs> he could just get so excited about it. Yeah, he, he, he was a good teacher, really. I mean, it, you remember. <laughs> Because of the way he felt about teaching, really. I mean, he was exceptional. I think. But I always like, I always like technical stuff. You know, you know, I just, I just love to tinker with things when I was a kid. Even you, know, you know, take, take. I used to take plans apart and things like that to see how they work. <laughs> Civil rights, you know, when a lot of the civil rights when people were going down to, uh, in fact, Stokely Carmichael was one of my classmates. Yeah, 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 he was a classmate. He went down. They were, they, you know, they were very active. I just never was, I, I just never was uh, activist like, like, like he was. Like a classmate in high school? Or? No, in college. Oh, not, yeah, he was at Howard. Oh, yeah. Stokely Carmichael was at Howard. Yeah. Oh. yeah, he was going down there to, you know, doing sit ins and all of that at the time. Yeah, so, you know, I was there when, you know, Ernie uh, McCain gave a speech on the wall there the time in Washington, D.C. You know. Okay, I do want to get into that, but first, I'm like, do you have any memories of, like, Cleveland in terms of, like, you know, like, the United Freedom Movement was one organization? No, no, not, no, I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, like, like I said, my thoughts, my, my whole thinking was not out there. It wasn't, you know, my thinking has never been really out there before that. It's been more, you know, I've been more like, for a long time kind of introverted and more, you know, just tinkering with things, you know, I just wasn't socially minded. I never have really, I haven't really been, you know, socially minded until I became an adult. And even then, I still have not been like an activist as such, you know. I don't know about this, I've never, just never been in that mode of thinking, you know. Yeah, no, that's no problem. I don't, sometimes people can be like that, but they might still like attend the demonstration. So no people are actively involved. No, definitely. Okay. 
So I am curious about your experiences at Howard being at HBCU around a very dynamic time. And so you spoke to Carmichael with all your classmates and went to Marshall Washington. Um, yeah, how would your experiences at Howard? I'm sorry? How would your experiences at Howard be just um, very well, I experienced it, um, you know, like I said, I don't, you know, I, I just, I mean, I struggled somewhat academically, so I never, um, you know, I just put all my energy into that, just trying to, just trying to, you know, study and, and, and pass each class. <laughs> I just put all my efforts into that. I just never, I never did much of anything else. You know, in fact, you see, how was that being federally funded? You know, they had, they had, ROTC, you know, it used to be mandatory ROTC uh, for, for two years. Okay, after uh, and then after two years, you know, it was uh, voluntary, voluntary. So I was in ROTC, you know, because every all the men, all the men had to be in ROTC for at least the first two years. And, and my plan, my plan at the time, I said, well, I was going to go into uh, into the service because at that time they had that program, they had a program where you could um, go in and just serve like a couple of uh, let's see, I think it was like six months. You could serve six months in active duty and then six years or four years or something like that in the in the reserve, active reserve. And so that was that was my plan at the time. And, but but see the program changed because that was just at the start of the Vietnam War program changed so that if you were going to go into, uh, if you were in the ROTC and then go into the service, you had, you had to stay for four years. But I was still, I was willing to do that, except that I was, you know, like I said, I struggled academically. So I joined the ROTC for the second two years, but with all of the, work that you had to do for just a couple of hours credit, you know, to me, I just couldn't, couldn't justify that kind of time commitment versus what I needed to do to try to, you know, keep up with my classes. So I, you know, I got, I got out of the uh, ROTC, uh, the second part of it. Okay. Uh, for, uh, you know, so I, so I could spend more time just, just for studying. And engineering is not, you know, it's not trivial. <laughs> In fact, we had a book. We had a book that was written by two professors from Case Western Reserve, a physics book, you know. And it was, you know I still have a book. <laughs> they had some, they had some problems in that book that were, that were very, very difficult. Everybody struggled with those, with those problems. You know, just, just hard. But we had one guy, one guy that was so smart. Though. He was, I, this one guy, he, he, he he was he was taking engineering as well, and he had all he had all A's almost for his entire time that he was there, and one B in, in a subject that he really didn't have to take, uh, physical chemistry. <laughs> but he got when he, when he was uh, graduating, he got an offer. From, he got an offer from, from Bell Labs. Uh, and they were going to pay for his graduate work as well as his salary. And that's how smart that guy was. I mean, was so. Yeah, I had one class with him. So I had one class with him uh, called Dynamics. You know, that's a part of it. You know, electrical people have to take uh, mechanical courses, and mechanical people have to take electrical courses. And then they had these problems in the, in the book. They have the, the first few exercises from what you have read in the chapter are, you know, just standard. And then they have the asterisk problems, you know, the ones that are a little more, you have to have a little more, you have to be able to think a little more. And he, he was so good, he, he, he would solve the asterisk problems and put them on the board. That's how smart this guy was. I mean, <laughs> I, I would just love to see where he is at this point in time. And then another, another person that, Oh, geez. Well, he was a commander. Uh, yeah, they had the people in the upper class in RCTC. You know, they would uh, took all the field exercises for the underclass 
Det er en lille sejtøj. Så he went into the Rangers. And he was uh, a couple of years killed here. And he went into the Rangers, into the Army. Graduated, he graduated. Uh, I mean, when he left the service, he went to work for Disney. Disney, and he rose with very high level there. Uh, I think he was moving. He was like in charge of your, what is it, the operation of France. And he had another, another guy became the uh, secretary of the army. So in that place, but he was uh, Togo West. Togo West, he was, he was uh, uh, secretary of the king, secretary of the army. So there were a lot of very, very, uh, very smart, smart guys there. Okay, but what year did you graduate? I graduated in 1965. Oh, so what did you do after you came out of Cleveland? Yeah, I went to work for JNL Steel Corporation. Mm -hmm. I stayed there for, like I say, four years before I went to the You know, <clears throat> then I started, I started, um, when I was at Ohio Bill, I was building uh, a construction department. We did the we prepared the drawings for supervised construction for what they call central offices. The central offices are where they house the telephone equipment. You know, and there's a, there's a central office in, in every area. The, the central office covers about five and a half acres. And they have another one that's as far out. You know, this was like all before the cell phones became available. And so each central office covered would cover about five miles, and so you had a lot of growth in terms of the number of people using phones. And, and if you have, unless you, the growth got to a certain point, you know, what they have to do is add to the building in order to accommodate the, the additional equipment, you know, that was required in order to accommodate more phones. So our department, we had the responsibility of preparing the drawings for you know building additions or new buildings. And so at that point, that's when I learned, I started doing what I was doing there on a full-time basis. I, I started doing it on a part-time basis as a part-time you know, engineering. I got I got license as a registered uh, electrical engineer take take the exam so that you register because if you do uh, if you do drawings that are going to be used for construction, you have to have a license, you know, so, you know, each state has to provide a license for engineers, so I got the license and I started doing part-time, part-time uh, engineering for architects, you know, doing small projects, and so I did that for a long time, I don't know if you've ever heard of, well, there's a, there's a, a black engineering firm called Whitley & Whitley. They're no longer in business, but when I got out of know, they were just getting started. When I got into business as well, so I worked for them. I did a lot of small jobs for them for a number of years. And in fact, see, because I wasn't a part of church at the time at all. You know, I grew up in the church, but once I went to college, I got out of going to church all the time. So I, uh, I did work for them, and then they just happened to have a but this was, this was uh, the book, 1993, perhaps. They had a project with this church, because this church, you know, they had uh, uh, the city operates a rec center. And so they had a project with the city to upgrade the electrical distribution in this church. And so I was working for them part time as a record and so and so that's when I even became introduced to the church. To this church? This church, oh. yes. And so right, we you know had meetings with the uh, trustees at the church at the time. The lady that uh, that was the uh, ch chairman of trustees, uh, Katie Bonner, she was the chairperson of the trustees and we met with them 
uh, in their meetings, one of their meetings, I was uh, attending the meetings. And so I, you know, that was related to the project. But then she, I got to know Katie Bonner, and she started asking me if I knew how to do, you know, some work, you know, physical work, as far as uh, she needed some lights replaced in the sanctuary. And, uh, and so, yes, I think I said I would do it for her. And I, you know, I got to know her and a couple other people, and, and that's how I got introduced to this particular church. And, and I kind of liked being part of what she was doing, you know, what the trustees were doing. And I've been here ever since. And that was like in the 70s? 1994. Oh, so this is 90s. Okay. 94, so almost, almost 30 years. Oh, okay. I think you said that. What was the name of Black Asian Young Card? Whitley Whitley. Whitley Whitley. How, how long was that around? Oh, they were around for, let's see, well, when I graduated, they were already established. Okay, they were already established, so, um, they were established as well as, uh, Madison, have you heard of Madison Engineer? Madison? Well, actually, Madison, Madison was even before Whitley. Whitley, Madison got started like 1947. They were, they were probably the first black architectural firm in Cleveland. The two brothers, um, uh, Bob Madison, um, one died something. Else. But Madison, and Madison are still around now. You know, there's, Madison started. They started. Uh, they were just architectural, uh, but then they started another. They they added, you know, engineering to their services. You know, in the eighties, and the engineering, and some of the engineers that they had broke away and started another company called Polytech. I don't know if you've heard of Polytech. Anyway, Polytech was around. You know, this is when they had a lot of uh, requirements for minority participation in construction projects that was done by the government, whether it's federal, state, or local. And a lot of the minority firms became. You know, a little more uh, prosperous once they had those kind of programs. Madison is one of the few ones that still left. But Polytech came and they're no longer in business. The various Tyler engineering that they were uh, established and they made one of the business. But Madison and Madison is still one of the few ones. But another one is called Roberts Consultants. You know, they, they are still around. Uh, and I did some of that myself, but I never, I never did it full time until I retired. You know, I, I did it like this you know, from a part time basis. You know, with you know, primarily with uh, uh, Whitney Whitney, I did a little work with the Madison, Madison. I did some work once I left and retired altogether. I did some work directly for the city of Cleveland. You know, I did some projects. Uh, uh, for this building as well as some other rec centers um, and uh, another project at the Harvard Yard. So I, I, I did a number of projects uh, uh, once I retired. And I'm still doing projects even now. I, even though you know, I spend probably more time here than I do actually doing projects, but I think I still do projects. There's another uh, like architectural firm uh, Calvin Singleton and Associates. They, they, uh, I do work with them. They're doing it right now. Together. So that's I know how it's been. I tell us a lot of time here, plus as well as doing engineering. Okay. I know at the time, like it was really hard for a lot of black people to get a uh, contract with construction projects, even sometimes work at construction sites. So or mm -hmm. some, some of those farms are the way to like you know get black people put in the door. Or give them skills necessary to well, see, I think, see what happened. I think what happened, well, what happened in the eight, early 80s, they started having what they call these uh, uh, minority participation and minority set aside programs at the federal, state, and the local level. Now, there was a lot of opposition to this, to these programs from. The minority, the majority contractor, basically, the uh, general contractor association, 
you know, they fought all of these programs almost for a long time. So what happened, you know, when they initially got started, they, you know, there was like, say for instance, at the state level, there was like a, originally like a 10% requirement on a lot of the, not all of the projects, but a lot of the projects had like a 10% requirement for minority participation on the design side and the construction side. Then, um, like I say, you know, some of the other contractors fought these programs, and what happened is they filed lawsuits and all, and then went through all the process that a lot of the programs got watered down, okay, to the point where, um, you know, like say, for instance, at the state level, the requirement became like instead of 10%, it was 5%. Well, 5% is a, you know, a requirement is almost as not as Desi well, it's obviously not as desirable, but it's even hard because you can't make as much money to make it even worthwhile when you're saying that the requirement is only 5%. The program at the federal level has not been really watered down, but those programs are a lot harder to uh, participate in. But if you know, because there's an awful lot of paperwork that you have to provide, first of all, prove that you are a legitimate uh, minority firm. Because, see, the other thing that was happening, even though there was opposition on the one hand, some other firm, some other contractors were using the program to say, okay, they, they would try to turn themselves into a minority program by making their wife the uh, principal. Okay, then they can say, okay, I'm a minority program or contractor or something and, and participate in the program that way. So, so the requirements for um, being certified as a minority contractor or a minority uh, firm, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of clickers that prove that you're just not a, uh, a front for a majority firm. Okay, so even now, you, know, you still, you know, I have certification in the city of Cleveland. You know, you have to fill out an application, which has to be renewed every year, and you have to, you know, like I say, the whole idea. Of Certification is to make sure that you are really uh, a minority company, and not just a front for a majority of the company. You know, so I, like I say, the city of Cleveland still has a program for that. Um, you know. So, so contractors do have opportunities. I mean, you know, minority contractors have, have opportunities to do to do uh, to do work. Okay, and that's some more opportunities that like probably going to start now. Right, it's more opportunities when I started out, but some of the pro some of the programs have been watered down compared to what they were when they first when they first started. But there's still opportunities out there, and then there's also opportunities on the private side. You know, there's another uh, organization called the National uh, Minority Suppliers Council. Now those are all private companies. But not, not, not uh, government, and so that so that you can interview. They have all kinds of events and opportunities for you to get to know the buyers at your company. So you know to participate in um, you know construction. You know, like Sherwin Williams building a new building downtown. You know, you have you know, they have a program where the minority contractors can participate in this process. That you have to go through before, even with the private companies. So, uh, so, th so there's, there's lots of opportunities there. In fact, I think there's probably more opportunities than there are people to actually do the work, you know, because they get, you know, there's, you know, one of the areas that's especially efficient in minority contractors is, you know, what you call low voltage wiring. Low voltage, you know, that's anything that has to do with it. Um, any type of uh, uh, outlets for Wi-Fi, audio, fire alarm, all of that, all of that's a little voltage wire compared to uh, you know, normal power type wire. And it's hard to find minority contractors that do that kind of work. So there's a, there's a efficiency there. And there's a demand, a lot of demand for that. Because almost every building, every new building, has an awful lot of uh, low voltage wiring associated with it. Because everywhere you go is Wi-Fi, 
every office, every every space has to have that capability, and you have to have the wiring done in order for that to be uh, accomplished. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot of opportunities there. In fact, you know, that's one of the reasons I think you know there's a demand, like say, for an area like this, in the Glenville area, where you have so many uh, families on public assistance. See, there's a, to me, a demand or a need to be able to provide opportunities for uh, young adults to learn uh, those kinds of uh, uh, trades. You know, as opposed to everybody thinking that the only way to really be successful is to go to college. There's an awful lot of work or jobs available, you know, where you don't need a college, but you need, but you need the technical skill. You need to know, you need to be able to do what's required. And those are a lot of those are good, very good paying jobs. So I think that's, for me, it's a big need in this, in this, uh, in this community. Uh, Okay. Uh, what neighborhood did you live in when you came back to Tracy? Oh, uh, let's see. What did I think it was? Uh, I think it was. I think it was. Oh, yeah. I, I moved to my, I, I moved back home. I moved back home with my mother. Because, you know, she was still struggling uh, financially. So I was trying to help out there. In Central? No, no, she, we, she, she, actually, she, she lived, she lived when I came back, she lived on, not too far from here, on Hamlet. Right, oh. That's right down the street here. Oh, okay. Yeah, Hamlet is right up there, the apartment. Yeah, she did say that. So I moved, I moved with her, stayed there a few years, we were trying to, trying to figure out how we were going to, uh, do that, because I didn't want to stay, I didn't want to live in my little mother. <laughs> You know, for a long period of time, so I was trying to figure out how could I manage to have my own place and still, you know, work out too. So that was a, kind of, kind of a, you know, kind of a struggle there for a while. Okay. Yeah, I know you say not too far from here, so were you aware of like some sort of social unrest that occurred in that area? It was a shootout in 68, and at such a point. Yes, I was aware of it. I was aware of it, but I didn't, like I say, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't participate in it. Oh. <laughs> I was curious about your reaction to it. I mean, Glenville 68 was pretty Yeah, yeah, Glenville, yeah, it was, you know, Puck area, all of that. Because that's when, you know, 68, that's when my family was doing what's assassinated. Mm -hmm. you know. Of course, the Vietnam War was still going. Uh, Okay. Um, okay, okay. So you came to Cory in the 90s. How has your experience been from the Cory? How oh, my experience been? Well, my experience has been, you know, I have been, I have been involved in, you know, I was, uh, I'm still a member of the trustee board. Of course, the membership has declined significantly since I've been, you know, a lot of, you know, mostly two people just are just passing and passing out after the law. And so, you know, I have been a member of the trustees uh, for a long time, as, as well as a member of the uh, finance committee. I'm chairperson of finance right now. And uh, my, my overall experience has been, I think, positive, and especially from the sense that the, the people, you know, are very dedicated to. Um, Church, uh, in terms of uh, you know, very reliable, committed people. I mean, especially the ones that are left and the ones that passed that have passed on. I mean, I mean, you can imagine that. You know, I mean, a building this size, um, and it's only like I would say fifty really active members. That contribute to the functioning of the church. And uh, without them, of course, we wouldn't be able to uh, even survive. Really. So, so it's an experience that, uh, you know, that I, you know, I'm just glad I had over the years. 
we've been fortunate in uh, having uh, Reverend Gregory uh, Kendrick decide here you know, to keep him in there uh, active in terms of this not. Um, but he's been more active in wanting to be more uh, oriented toward the community and getting uh, Corey involved in the community. So, so we are hoping that we can start to make some changes in positive direction in terms of church growth because it's uh, you know, with the few members that we have. Unless we do something that's certainly not sustainable. Okay. Um, one, one question I'm curious about. How do you describe the new neighborhood since the, uh, you know, since, since you came back in six months? I've seen photographs and I know it looks different than it looks now. I mean, not as popular as I don't know. Right, right. Uh, I, my, my feeling is, you know, I think that um, the Glenville neighborhood, like a lot of other predominantly uh, like neighborhoods, are uh, they, they need, in my, my, my opinion, is that they need more. Uh, Leadership from um, the outside, and, and I think that the black churches are really uh, are in a position to provide that leadership. I think that the, uh, it just is not hap happening the way I think it should. And I, and I think the you know, most of the black churches tend to be too insular, you know, to, uh, instead of being more outwardly focused. And I believe that uh, Pastor Kendrick is a little more outwardly focused, but I, I don't know if just one church alone can do it without starting to involve other churches to, to, to try to do something in the neighborhood, you know, to. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, it, there's just a lot of, it's just a lot of issues that need attention, you know, in terms of uh, uh, housing, you know, just the condition of housing maintenance, that's one of the issues, health issues, you know, the food that people, uh, you know, people tend to go out and buy fast food. As opposed to preparing your own food. education, you know, there's, there's people that really need more uh, attention to education. Just like I say, you know, there's there's a need for people in certain areas where there's a deficiency. People need to be trained in, in some of these areas. And uh, economics in general, you know, people need to you know become more, you know. Thinking in terms of being self-sufficient, there's a tendency, I think, for people to be too dependent on uh, public assistance. So all of these issues, I think, are um, areas where you know black churches need to be. I know there's you know they, a lot of them just want to be spiritual oriented, which is fine, but I think that. Uh, there's just a big need to be more socially involved in some of the areas that I was talking about. That's all my questions. I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.